All right. Thank you very much. This is our uh, this is our I see a Region Six virtual meeting. My name is Brent Johnston. I'm the regional director of uh, of Region Six, and um, today our program is going to be on digital engineering. So you, you've heard all the buzzwords: digital engineering, digital transformation, Industry 4.0. Uh, you've heard all those uh, all those buzzwords used. You've heard it uh, in the industry papers. You've heard government officials talk about it. So what does that really mean? And what is, especially from the perspective of, of cost estimating and cost estimators and, and how are we supposed to deal with it uh, when a lot of people really don't understand what, what all is involved. So we're very fortunate today to have someone to help guide us through this conversation. Um, our guest is Dr. Don Kynard. Uh, Dr. Kynard is a senior fellow for Lockheed Martin Aeronautics Production Operations and he's been with Lockheed for 36 years. Don supports digital transformation uh, as well as programs like the F-35. Um, prior to his current assignment, he was the lead F-35 production rate transition. Uh, uh, and also, and earlier than that, he was director of uh, F-35 production of engineering and response. he was responsible for joint strike fighter tooling, planning, manufacturing engineering and aircraft systems tests. Uh, before he was involved with F-35, he was on the F-22 program uh, for 18 years. He had positions in both engineering and manufacturing. So Don knows both sides of the house, uh, as it will. And uh, also add that, that, that he is a graduate of Texas A&M. So he's an Aggie, so don't hold that against him. Um, <laughs> all right. So Don, I'm going to turn it over to you and then uh, you can take it away. Thank you, Brent. It's uh, great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. I'm going to go through a lot of information here today, and I'm going to go through it relatively quickly. And if you need something else or want to want more information, you're willing to contact me. I'm I'm uh, on LinkedIn, so that's the way I contact people pretty pretty often. Uh, I want to talk about the digital keys, all the words we hear about: threads, twins, technology, and transformation. But first, a public service message for Lockheed Martin. Uh, Lockheed Martin is the largest defense contractor in the world. We have four divisions, four business areas, aeronautics that I work for, rotary and mission system, which includes Sikorsky helicopters, missiles and fire control uh, right next door here in Grand Prairie, Texas, and of course, space company with the Orion program and many other types of launch vehicles. People, we have 110,000 employees total, roughly. About 58,000 of those are scientists and engineers. By the way, we need more every day. So if you're looking for a change, come see Lockheed Martin. Uh, we operate facilities all over the world and we're in 54 countries. So it's really a dynamic environment and we do business all over the world basically. And right now that's particularly true because certainly P Putin's been one of our best salesmen right now. Uh, let's talk about aeronautics. That's the division I work for about 30,000 people, lots of locations global partnerships, and uh, really we're scattered all over the United States and the world. Uh, aeronautics production-wise, we have the F-35 line in Fort Worth, Texas. We're making about 13 aircraft a month, which is absolutely incredible. One of the most advanced factories in the world for making that kind of fighter. In Marietta, Georgia, we've been making C-130s since uh, I was uh, very small and uh, continue to do them at about two a month, F-16s. F-16 shut down here in Fort Worth about five or six years ago, but the demand was so intense that we started up our, a new facility in Greenville, South Carolina, and that first aircraft will get delivered sometime later this year. And finally, Skunk Works, Advanced Development. Go see the new uh, Top Gun movie. You'll see a bunch of skunk stuff out there in, in that movie. Can't show you anything that we do but I, other than the clouds, but that's the way it goes. First of all, what is digital transformation? Why are, we, why are we doing it? What do we want out of it? Well, the first one is speed. It takes so long today to go from prototypes to development, to SDD, EMD program, to IOC, which is initial operating capability. We've got to shorten that span time from program initiation to IOC. That's one. Two, we want to be more agile to respond to customer changing requirements. The customers always want stuff. We got to be able to react agilely. We want to be more data driven. We want to have insight into our data 
And that's when I get to industry 4.0 later in the presentation, that's what that is about. How do I, how do I get my data together? And what does it mean to me to have my data together? And finally, obviously, the, the, the main reason we do it is for competitiveness. We want to, we have a lot of other companies in this business. Uh, we call them competitive because sometimes, like on F-35, we're teamed with Northrop and BAE. On F-22, we were teamed with Boeing. And so it's, a, it's one of those uh, uh, situations where we're either competing or teaming, uh, depending on the program. What are, what are our four pillars of uh, digital transformation? One is we've got to reduce the product support and the product development costs. That's the time to get to the product to market. We want to be able to use discriminating materials and manufacturing capabilities and sustainment. We want to automate our enterprise data collection processes and use uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning to get more insight into the data. And finally, of course, uh, since we tend to purchase about 75% of the products we build, we need to have a robust supply chain uh, and that has been really tough the last couple of years with the COVID uh, impact, but we have a half robust supply chain for both production as well as uh, sustainment in the field. The digital thread. Well, this is interesting. The digital thread was is an old connotation. It was in, developed uh, really back in the early 90s. And we used it in the F-35 as one of our key threads in there. And the digital thread is very simply the creation, use, and reuse of engineering data from engineering, manufacturing, suppliers, and sustainment. So we start with 3D solid models. We do integration with 3D solid models. We do digital verification, lots of simulations. We drive uh, digital fabrication, uh, use graphics for our planning, do use that same digital data for things like NC program. I'm gonna talk a lot about manufacturing in a minute. And finally, we consume that digital data and sustainment for the tech orders and maintenance training aids and everything else. So we are a, a large uh, user of all the information. And these digital threads uh, have been, for example, F-35 was the first big program. The 3D solid models changed everything for us. I mean, I worked, F-22 was not a 3D solid model program. The difference between the F-22 program I worked and the F-35 was night and day. It was absolutely amazing, the differences that we saw. And that was a big cost driver, a cost saver to, for example, uh, not have to do a lot of redesign, not have to deal with a lot of our supplier problems because they weren't 3D solid models. Uh, the model was, ex the model that we released to the, to the, Suppliers was the same model they used to do NC programming to. So a whole lot of savings all through the supply chain, all the way into sustainment. Now let's talk about the digital twin. So the digital thread supplies the data that feeds digital twins. Now digital twins are virtual representations of physical assets, and it could be actual virtual representations of assets that don't yet exist. And what you do with a digital twin is you try to create, it's a model, it's a simulation. And we try to be able to mimic or represent the performance of the final product, the aircraft, the missile, the car, whatever that is, by using the digital twin. And that digital twin allows us to better and better develop the product. So this is one of the areas, in fact, the most important area probably for future cost savings is using digital twins. Because one, we want to be able to use digital twins to get much more mature products before we start releasing drawings and models for them. And two, we want to mature those digital twins to be able to predict the performance of the aircraft so that we can reduce flight testing, lab testing, structural testing. So they work on both ends of the spectrum. And, and I want to say this is the wave of the future more and more dependence on uh, digital twins, modeling and simulation to reduce and mature the initial design cycle, as well as to reduce the testing. Our product, uh, for example, F-35, uh, we, we were in flight test for almost a decade. And that's the kind of thing we're trying to work on. How can we, how can we consume some of that span time in testing into a digital twin? Uh, of course, the difficulty 
is it is not only developing the digital twins, but also convincing the customers that the digital twin actually represents the performance of the aircraft. So those are things that we're working on to try to improve that for the future. We created a, a digital twin maturity model to help guide this process along. Uh, in level one over on your far left, that's the virtual digital twins. These are the digital twins we create. Now, I also got to point out that there's lots of digital twins. There's structural twins, there's mission system twins, there's vehicle system twins, there's operations analysis twins, supply chain twins, lots of different kinds of twins. At first, we start out with them being more virtual, and this is in preparation for starting development. And the better we do there, the more the, the risk of development is lowered and also the number of changes we get. As we get into level two, we're starting to, to test parts of that aircraft. We're starting to do uh, system qualifications, for example, and structural qualifications to develop, and we feed that data to the digital twin. In level three, this is the more sophisticated level digital twins where they actually represent the uh, uh, like, for example, we're collecting, doing full scale structural testing or flight testing, and all of that data is being fed to the digital twin. Because in level four, the intent is to have a digital twin that truly represents the product and the behavior of the product, so that then we can use that to buy off requirements for the customers. Now, the key here, obviously, is today what we do is we start out with prototypes or virtuals and then we test, 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 test for years. What we need to do is shrink that time frame down. And that's why the digital twins are the key element to the shrinkage of the product development cycle because we wanna go from the virtual twin to the level four twin as quickly as possible. The level five twins are special because that's where what we want to do is be able to use the twins in, a, in an ecosystem with other twins. We want the twins to be able to engage each other and coordinate with, with each other in a common joint all domain environment. And so when you hear JADO environment, that's what we're talking about, where these twins will essentially engage each other and coordinate and cooperate and communicate in an in a ecosystem where all the twins play together. Again, this is where we're going, not always where we are. Uh, the key is uh, we spend an awful lot of time and money today developing level four twins. That's what ha we have to do a lot faster. And we do that by utilizing all of the past programs to get better and better at the twins, okay? So let's talk about using the digital T's, look at using them in manufacturing. First of all, we do a lot of automated drilling. The automated drilling is, is enabled by the digital thread, enabled by the modeling and simulations that we do. And we do an awful lot of this. That, that's one of the, you know, one thing about robotics is they're very repeatable and reliable. So we do a lot of automation. Now, granted, automation is typically for higher volume products and F-35 kind of hits that level of enough aircraft, enough flow through the factory to really justify automation. If I'm building, a, you know, one rocket ship a year, uh, it may not actually rise to the level where it, you're able to do that. Robotic coatings, all of our coatings are applied with robots. This is uh, one of the models I built for paint uh, years ago when I was the production engineering director. And we built this one because they didn't really want me practicing on real airplanes, so they made me build model to do it. And uh, I can understand that, but in uh, any case, this has really helped us perfect the process of robotic coatings. Uh, you hear 3D additive manufacturing all the time. Uh, we're not to the point where we're using additive manufacturing for any real parts. There's a lot of issues there. That's a whole other presentation. Uh, but let's just say that we're using the heck out of the technology to make 3D printed tools, to, to build uh, you know, production aids, to do tooling for maintenance in the field. Uh, so we've made thousands and thousands and thousands of parts with we have like 15 or so of these printers in the factory and we turn out stuff all the time to use. It. So it's been very, very useful for that. Optical projection. This is a use of the, the, the 3D model, the digital twin. And what this, this is doing is we're actually projecting on, into this inlet here, what fastener goes in what hole. 
So instead of taking what we do in the past, it's interesting, we would take a, uh, a drawing and the, that mechanic would take the drawing and start physically marking with pencil on each hole about what fastener goes in that hole. Well, today what we're using is optical projection. You could also use augmented reality, which I'll talk about in a minute, to be able to, to really bridge that gap between the 3D models and the mechanics. Again, a lot of the objective of digital transformation and you know the digital twins and digital thread is to be able to get the 3D data into the hands of the mechanics to make his job faster, better, and a higher quality. And this is another example of that. Non-contact non metrology or advanced metrology. What we're doing here today is now we're taking 3D images of our, our as-built structure, comparing it directly to the 3D models. So we're basically doing as-designed to as-built validation all along the value chain of building the airplane. We find mistakes earlier. Uh, we're able to do automated inspections even. And it, it's really replacing a lot of the old style technologies and in a faster, cheaper mode. And this technology has exploded over the past about seven or eight years into being something we use all the time. You know, I can, I can install brackets on a, uh, on a bulkhead, for example, and use this advanced metrology to measure those and validate that the brackets are where they belong. That's a, been a big, big part of where we are. Again, this is another version of it. I can use the technology to measure fastener flushness, to measure detailed parts, to measure seams and gaps and coating thicknesses. So the technology is, is very useful to replace a lot of older techniques that are much more, uh, how we call cost inefficient. Here's some, a couple of the new robots we have. Uh, again, because of the volumes we have on F-35, the one on the top left corner is a robot. And we have been doing, even though we drill a lot of holes automatically, we still drill a lot of holes manually. And what that robot does is provide the countersinks for those that had been done manually. Manual is a, is a problem because the one, there's a lot of quality problems and two, the mechanics risk get tired and there's some issues with carpal tunnel and all that kind of thing. The robot at the bottom, uh, there is a robot that's measuring coating thicknesses and again, vastly more efficient than what we've done in the past. So again, these are some manufacturing uses for digital thread, digital twins. Another example here, uh, these robots are are actually, we're putting a tool on the airplane with these two big robots, Zeus and Thor, and we're injecting coatings between the tool and the airplane. And then we're actually measuring those coating thicknesses and, and in real time. And for example, any place where you see that yellow color is means it's too thick and we would just sand it down till it turns green. So those are the kinds of technologies that we're using on the, in the factory. Here's scanning of edges. Again, we're looking at, does the part conform to the engineering? And this is another opportunity to reduce cost by having better quality to start with. Uh, here's auto, augmented reality. We've been using augmented reality in our training programs for about five years now, where the mechanics would come in. And we have found it particularly useful for harnesses because it's been very difficult to see the 3D root of the harnesses uh, in, in looking at it in any way. But this, this augmented reality, by the way, you could have the glasses on. Uh, personally, I prefer tablet applications for AR as opposed to putting on you know, the, the different, different styles of glasses, but uh, you, know, you could use that too. But this helps the mechanics not only wire the harnesses, and route the harnesses to the clamps, but then we use it to help inspection inspect the routing of the harnesses. So another op opportunity. Tubing automation, same way. Um, it's amazing. Uh, this is a, a laser robot that cuts the tubes, and this is a automated inspection cell where I'm using structured light to scan that tube. Uh, <laughs> if you've been around a while, what I used to do if I, had a, if I had a problem with the tube fitting, I used to send it down to a CMM and two weeks later I get my answer. 
Well, today I can sit it basically set it on the table, put in the part number, and it inspects it and tells me whether it's correct very, very quickly. So another application of that. And I think the final one I'm going to show here is uh, this is a robot, and that's a, a model. Once again, they don't like me using real aircraft to do practice on, but that's a model for the forward fuselage. And those four robots are designed to fill the fasteners all over that airplane. So we have lots of fasteners to fill. The robot basically fills it with some with a hot iron and some thermoplastic material. It comes back, it skives it off, it comes back and sands it, and then it comes back and inspects it with a laser gauge. And when all of those are working together, it's really something to see. And we have more stuff coming. And one of one of the one of the big advantages of F-35 is the long runway. Uh, you know, we've built and delivered now almost 800 aircraft or over 800 aircraft, but we're going to build, we think, uh, with Putin's help, another three or 4,000 aircraft over the next few years. Uh, and again, we're going to, obviously, there's a lot of demand for F-16s as well as F-35s, uh, but we're putting in new robots. Uh, again, robots have their place. We're we are not a company that believes in a uh, you know lights out factory that's totally automated. That's not that's not our future. We will always depend on having highly trained and skilled mechanics to do a vast majority of our work. But but work that's I would call dull, dangerous, and dirty is are good candidates for for robotics. And you know you've got to be real careful about how you do the cost analysis for these uh, because. Uh, you know, we, we're a kind of a weird business. If you're, uh, you know, regular businesses, uh, regular normal businesses care a lot about span time and whip. Uh, you know, defense projects are funded quite a bit differently where span time isn't necessarily the huge driver that it is for basically commercial products. However, we have to pay attention to it. So we really care about uh, hours per unit and cost and quality is a big deal. So the robots kind of bring us in particular that quality aspect of it. One of the things we've just started working now is, is pretty awesome is, uh, is being able to do automatic kitting of fasteners. We have tens of thousands of fasteners that we install and we now have a system that's just getting started that basically uh, kits those fasteners, cleans those fasteners, bags those fasteners and delivers them to the mechanics on the floor. Uh, whereas before we were having the mechanics actually go and pick all those fasteners out of bins and put them together as a set. So this is, uh, this is coming online right now. Okay, let's talk about, that's kind of where we are in digital transformation. And you, you'll find there that we spend an awful lot of time uh, in the manufacturing side of it. And it's interesting, being, being a manufacturing person for the last few years, manufacturing people, you know, basically walk around with targets on our backs because they're always looking at manufacturing costs, even though, honestly, manufacturing costs, the actual touch labor is a, is a small fraction of the flyaway cost of most of our products. Again, I mentioned 75% of the cost is really in the supply chain and, you know, the rest being, you know, the build and support and all of that kind of thing. Let's talk about some future activities. I mentioned how important it is to get a more mature product starting out. And that means those virtual twins need to be better and better and better. And that's why the engineering tool integration is so important. We've got to develop better tools for modeling and simulation so that we start a program with a more, a low risk product that meets the customer's requirements. And maybe even at some point, we decide we don't need prototypes. It's kind of a Will, Dr. Will Roper, when he was in the job with the DOD, he was pushing the idea of an e-plane. And an e-plane would replace a prototype to be able to do the basic uh, analysis. And then we'd go right into production. So that may be the, one of the ways of the future. I think it probably is, uh, is to be able to use virtual models as prototypes and compete on the virtual space. Manufacturing simulations are, are a big part of it. This is the X-59 low-boomed aircraft out in Palmdale. Uh, we are using manufacturing simulations to try to predict producibility of the aircraft, uh, how, the, 
how the tools fit into the aircraft. So this is a good application. The, the manufacturing and simulation tools have advanced tremendously over the past, since we started F-35, which is almost 25 years ago. And the tools have gotten much better over then. And of course, we're using those to, once again, anything you can do to identify problems ahead of time is value added. Determine an assembly. The, the, the entire Western world and the commercial world puts together, you know, they basically have holes drilled in all the structure and put it together. Uh, that's where everyone's going. Uh, so the, the A and D world, the, uh, you know, the aerospace and defense world is headed the same direction. You know, Toyota doesn't drill any holes on assembly and that's kind of the future of work. This is a big deal uh, for us, for everybody. Uh, to be able to use the, and, and really the difference is how accurate the, the machines are these days, the machining centers, the technology to, to, to be able to put holes in detailed parts. Again, uh, Missiles and Fire Control in Grand Prairie has not drilled holes at assembly for ages. And, you know, obviously most commercial products do not either. So, uh, but, but now our world is headed this direction too. Great opportunity. Once you have full size holes, once you have determined assembly uh, in your parts, then the other idea is how do you put them together faster? How do you do the assembly faster? So there's some automated assembly we're working on, for example, with NIAR. Uh, those are things that, that are for the future for the next program. Let me do industry 4.0 quickly now. The revolution, I call it the industrial revolution of data. As everyone knows, there's been three industrial revolutions so far. We had the agrarian revolution. We had the uh, you know, electrical power revolution. And then we had the computer revolution. And now it's the data revolution. We have a physical aircraft factory, but we also have a data factory that we, that we, where we collect the data, we use the data to supply for the customer, to use it for our own processes. The interesting part to me is that, and this is what, what they call Conway's law, is that the data in all of our big IT tools, like a PLM tool, MES tool, ERP tool, sustainment tools, the data tends to follow the organizational bureaucracy of the organization that creates that system. For example, PLM tends to be an engineering system. MES is a manufacturing system. MRP, ERP is a finance and, and supply chain tool and of course sustainment. And they all take on their own flavors. And many times you'll notice a very kind of broken thread there. This means that that data between them is not free flowing and connected. And many times it means that there's people in the loop to be able to transfer data from one system to the other. I find this all over, this is normal. This is normal. This is where most of the world is today. However, that's not where we're going to be 10 years from now. Industry 4.0 is connecting all of those systems, connecting all of that data, connecting engineering with manufacturing, with supply chain, with sustainment. These little robots here imply that, uh, you know, we use a, something we call robotic process automation. And that's really taking the place of people in the loop to do all of this analysis and all of these reports. In the future, most standard reports will be automated. Data will be automated. It'll be available on your dashboard. Um, you know, things that we do uh, cost-wise. There's an excellent article out there. It was in the New York Times, and it said, and, and Brent, you can close your ears for this, but it said, uh, the robots are coming for fill-in accounting. Okay? The point is, is that the world is changing with respect to how we handle data. Uh, we will do a lot more automation of data in the future. Uh, reports will be automated. <clears throat> and it's really going to change everything, very much like how it changed uh, when we got computers. I mean, I'm, I've been here long enough to not have had computers when I started here, and that changed everything. Uh, this will change everything, too. The data will become more and more automated, more and more insightful. And it's not just about having data people. You got to have people that understand the technology and the processes that then become data people. And so we're pushing the concept of a citizen data scientist, meaning we'll take people that understand our processes 
and train them how to manage data. You know, uh, tools like uh, Python that everybody's heard about. And, you know, th there's a lot of different tools out there, but those are the kinds of things uh, that'll be used more and more and more. So a summary, first of all, the digital thread has been used to support manufacturing sustainment, the technology uh, providing cost savings for manufacturing and quality improvements. And that's something that'll continue automation. Um, you know, one of, it's interesting that one of the things the industry really cares about these days is do, are we gonna have enough people to actually do the work in the future? So some of the drive for automation is because we realize that, you know, everybody's struggling today to get people to actually do the work. Uh, the other part of that is where we can really get a cost advantage and where we can really get quality advantages. The key to cost and span time reduction is, is frankly, especially on development programs, the use of digital twins to one, have better products at the start, and secondly, to reduce the, the, the requirements for physical testing. And finally, Industry 4.0, the next general industrial revolution is here. Uh, data integration, automation will bring improved visibility, allow predictive performance improvement, and, and again, provide another excellent opportunity for cost reduction. But, but, but let me tell you, there is an all, in all of this, there's an, enormal, there's an enormous amount of cultural barriers to change. Um, I tell people all the time, and I always use the term, you know, years and years ago, uh, uh, Blockbuster Video could have bought Netflix, but they decided they were in the film rental business and not in the streaming business. Okay, uh, Kodak decided to, that they wanted to keep making film and, and they had some of the original patents on digital cameras. And this is something that industry has got to be very wary of. You can't rest on what's been done in the past. You've got to embrace the change, embrace the change that's coming because uh, you don't want to be the guys uh, building buggies when the cars are driving on the interstate. In any case, uh, with that, I will stop sharing and uh, see if anybody has any questions. Okay. So Don, I'd, I'd like to throw out a question uh, myself. So um, on this subject, if anybody hasn't read it, I would I would highly suggest you go out on the internet and find uh, Dr. Will Roper's uh, paper that he wrote. Uh, Dr. Roper was he was former Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition Technology and Logistics. This is a real passion of his. This whole topic of digital engineering. And digital transformation. He wrote a paper called Take the Red Pill, which is a reference to the movie The Matrix. And uh, Dr. Roper made a lot of claims uh, about the benefits, especially the cost benefits of, of digital engineering and transformation and the necessity for both government and industry to, to push as hard as they can to make that happen. Don, I'm, I'm, and any any reference to some programs that are currently uh, being done, like the ground-based strategic deterrent, which is the replacement for the Minuteman Three ICBM, and the T7, the, the trainer, um, uh, that's the replacement for the T38. So, so Don, I'm I'm curious what you think. Um, well, two things. What do you think? What is the customer's opinion about the, the U.S. government customer's opinion about digital engineering and digital transformation? And secondly, what do you think about Dr. Roper's claims as far as what the cost benefits are going to be? Uh, well, let's talk about first the, the Air Force, the, all of our customer community. I will say at the top level is wildly enthusiastic about digital engineering and the promises of digital engineering. I, I don't think that most er, everybody understands what that means. You know, the idea of having sophisticated modeling and simulation is not going to come quickly or easily. It's going to be a slog to get to the technology levels. Actually, I kind of see that as a great opportunity for industry, academic, and government intervention to develop those modeling and simulation tools that can truly represent physical, these complex physical assets. And I'm not talking about just aerodynamic performance. You know, we spend a jillion dollars on software development and hardware and loop testing, and Roper had a big thing on that. 
secondly, I'm going to say that uh, I, I've been working digital transformation now for almost seven years. And when Real Roper's articles came out a few years ago, uh, I felt very vindicated that what I've been saying for the last few years is exactly what he's saying, meaning our future is modeling and simulation. There, there is enormous opportunities for cost savings by having a better product. I mean, just, just imagine that I start out a, a program with a more mature product where instead of a 70% learning curve or something, I might have a 85 or 90% learning curve. Toyota starts out at like 95 or 96% learning curve. But the point is, is that that's because they have a highly mature product. So I think there's a lot of advantages there. And then the second part of that is being able to use those same digital twins to, to do uh, virtual testing instead of a decade of flight testing. And that, so, so I believe that, in fact, I, I'll be honest with you, the two biggest opportunities in our kind of business are in the use of digital engineering to mature the product early and to, and to use it for test validation. So I'm right there with Dr. Roper and, uh, you know, he's, he's working now a little bit with uh, Georgia Tech and uh, that kind of thing. So we look forward to continued working with him. So one of the, I mean, on that point, Don, one of the things that Dr. Roper said in the paper was he was talking about specifically about T7, and, and I'm going to quote what he said. He said that T7 demonstrated an unprecedented real-world learning curve reduction, T1 equal to T100, using digital threads to both simplify and learn assembly digitally. Of course, you know, we don't have that data, right? We don't know exactly if he's referring to the prototypes that were built or, or what, but I mean, that's kind of suggestive of some of the, you know, radical transformations that could happen if, if this technology is fully matured, right? Well, I, I think it's funny. I don't, I don't, and I don't want to assault any of my Boeing brethren that are online, but let's just say that Boeing did a hell of a job with Dr. Roper during the development of the T-7 in terms of convincing him of, you know, what they could do. And so, but the bottom line is, uh, and I, we have seen evidence of tremendous advantages in uh, tremendous advantages for not only the engineering side, but the manufacturing side using this digital technology. So, so I, I guess, uh, you know, time will tell, but I, I'm going to say I'm a believer. And, and I'm a believer probably not so much because of the hype that's in the market, but, but because, you know, you know where the money is. And I, and, and I stress that a lot. Brent and I talk all the time about this. But, you know, I spend a lot of time trying to figure out where we spend money and what, what are the opportunities to do that. And let me tell you, the, the, the amount we spend in development and the amount we spend in tests are the big drivers for us in terms of span time and cost. So. And, and I think there's an issue, too, that you've got to get, you know, everybody on board. I, I remember, again, I'm going to age myself, back in the day when, on F-35 when we were starting out, there were there were some pretty ambitious plans to go reduce the amount of flight tests that were required. And, uh, you know, the government flight test community was like, no way. <laughs> we're, we don't care what your models say. We don't care what the simulations say. We're going to fly this thing till the wings fall off. You know, we're, we're going to, you know, we don't believe the simulations. And there was a lot of customer resistance at the time. And obviously the tools are a lot less mature then than they are now. But, I mean, there's still that resistance, right? So. Well, that's, that's actually the, one of the biggest hurdles is the cultural hurdles. You know, we've been doing things a certain way. Uh, we have our own internal mafia that's that likes to do things a certain way. The customer has their own mafia that likes to do things their way. And uh, the question is, is the Air Force hierarchy that's really pushing this digital engineering going to be able to overcome? Because at some level, we're going to have to make the very slow, deliberate move to depend more and more on modeling than, than physical testing. But that's not going to be a short-term thing. You know, how do you convince a customer that, that the model works? Well, you have, you have to be able to validate it sometimes with test data. So it might be a mix of physical testing and, and analysis for a while until they grow to appreciate the fact that our models can really represent the physical, the physical asset. And again, that's just going to take time. Okay, so we got a question here uh, about digital twins. So question is, is it, so uh, this 
a digital twin is a the digital twin just a very very advanced simulation is it basically something that is able to simulate all the characteristics of the design uh first of all two things one a digital twin can be simply a model of a of a regular part like a bulkhead so a digital twin of a bulkhead is in fact a model of a bulkhead it can be a model and simulation of of the aerodynamics of an airplane. So it can represent the airplane. It can represent the, uh, uh, a vehicle system or emission system on the airplane, the sensors. So there's lots of digital twins. And no, I don't believe that you'll ever have a single digital twin that represents the overall performance for a complex product. I believe that you're gonna have multiple digital twins that are used to simulate various aspects of a product, but not a single digital twin that does everything. But yes, they are advanced models and simulations typically that today use an enormous amount of test data to verify. And, and we use that data, the test data to actually model. In the future, as we get better and better at it, the models will then predict behavior with less and less testing. And that's the whole point. So one of the things on that line, one of the things Dr. Roper said in the paper, he was talking about the, the GBSD, the, the ground-based strategic deterrent. Um, he said that over 6 billion variants were digitally designed prior to selecting the one uh, defined for the, to go into the missile silos. I, I don't know what, 6 billion sounds like an awful lot to me, but I mean, I guess that's that's indicative of some of the possibilities if you can, if you can do this kind of thing at a, at a higher level and, and, and have very mature models. I mean, there's a lot of stuff you could do from a design perspective that hasn't been possible in the past and I, a lot I, faster, right? I think that's absolutely true. I'm a, again, uh, I have seen what, what you can do in limitless. We, we've had, we've actually had been able to use digital twins to buy off certain performance features of our aircraft already. And that's just going to get better and better. And you're right. Uh, you know, Brent and I worked through uh, during F-35 where we were trying to sell uh, our mission system laboratories to replace flight testing for a whole bunch of things. And there was a lot of resistance to that because we didn't necessarily have evidence for it. I think we would have a lot better shot now at new programs based on what we did in the past. And in fact, I'll point out that's a key thing is we've got to use the data from all of our legacy programs and programs that we're working currently and build upon that digital twin technology. We've got to, we've got to have tools that truly can represent airplanes and reduce testing. And that's just going to take, you know, show me, show me the proof. So. So we have another question that asks about metrics for tracking ongoing or future cost reduction projections or savings. Um, what is, what are, what is, I mean, to the extent you can share this, right? What is Lockheed doing? What are our competitors doing? How, how are people trying to quantify or capture what those cost reductions and savings are going to be? That's, that's not an easy thing to go do, right? I mean, it's, it's actually, I have found one of the most difficult things to do. One, because of the way we typically collect costs for legacy programs, meaning the data is not always cl crystal clear in terms of where the money went. That's one aspect. The other aspect is we can do the manufacturing thing pretty well. I mean, manufacturing has a, a better handle. We've done a lot of automation. Uh, we, we, we kind of know that part real well. The part that's really hard is the engineering development and test uh, to know how all that comes together. So, but, but, but what we do do, what we, or the whole corporation of Lockheed is doing, is trying to understand that, that impact and those opportunities. And it's going to be a little piece at a time, but, and metrics are very important. And, you know, for example, uh, how well do our digital twins work? How many tests do, are we allowed to buy off uh, without having to do the, the actual flight test? Uh, but again, those are long-term kinds of metrics that we've got to keep. But probably the, the most important one, interestingly enough, is what are we going to bid on new programs? You know, what do we bid for the new ones? How are we going to take advantage of it? Uh, again, we've seen a lot of advantages for the digital thread, the digital twins already. 
And, and so we bid, we bid based on what we know, but again, that's going to keep changing as we get better. So that's the hardest part though, is, is, is betting on the future, you know, based on where we are today. Yeah, I was, I was struck. I saw a presentation in, in, in Pittsburgh at the ICA conference in May and Rand Corporation gave a, they're working on a paper for the Air Force on digital engineering. And, and one of the things that they said was they had reviewed over 800 papers and out of that, there were only two of them that had uh, some kind of published, uh, you know, quantified cost benefit related to, to DE or DT, uh, most, most people were just, there's a lot of hand waving in other words, you know, ah, it's gonna save a lot of money, you know, but it, not a lot of publicly available or, or, or data that they could grab onto. And that's one of the things that they're, they're struggling with is to try to figure out, okay, well, what do I tell people to do in the future, right? If I'm, you know, your government evaluators or, or even industry. Um, so let me ask a question. So back to the question about digital twins and, and you talked about how uh, the digital twin is, it is not necessarily an all encompassing thing. It could be pieces or aspects of performance or characteristics of the plane or the system. So, but in the chart that you showed uh, that showed the different levels, level five was kind of the ecosystem. That was kind of the, you know, hey, it does everything, right? It's a fully, integrated descriptive twin of the, of the design of the system. I mean, that's, that's the Nirvana, right? That's what we're supposedly working toward, right? Well, not, not really. Again, <clears throat> those twins are that we use in that joint all domain environment, the level fives <clears throat> are intended to have the features that are important to that particular scenario for example how how communicate how they communicate uh, their sensors uh, their range but things things like you know fuel system simulations and you know hydraulic simulations and even structural simulations are are, are may not be really required to to have on a model that's working in this joint all domain environment so I think it depends. Certainly the OA models, operations analysis models, are the most complete of what we'll be doing, uh, you know, putting together for, for those environments. But they still don't, you know, they don't have the manufacturing twin part of it, the sustainment twin part of it, unless you're looking at, you know, battle space sustainment. So there's, there's still selected pieces that are part of those level five models. But it, again, it's really hard to see it, anything that could, could have everything all together. That would imply that we have a single tool that simulates all those different aspects. And I just, it's hard for me to envision that today. So since, since uh, in, your, in your second work life, you've been a manufacturing guy, let's, let's talk a little bit about the determinant assembly and, and some of the some possibilities there. Um, Certainly, that's something that's been talked about for a long time. I remember being at uh, Bombardier in the late 90s, and they were talking about doing what they called hole-to-hole -hole assembly on uh, Canada region, uh, regional jets. Um, so... Some of the and you talked about some of the benefits of the potential benefits of that, you know, much simpler tooling, right? If I don't have to have a tool that holds everything perfectly in place while I go do drilling and I have to hold, uh, you know, five thousandths of an inch tolerance or what have you, um, you know, that that frees up a lot of potential there for, you know, for tooling costs. Um, shimming if i don't have to go shim at uh, um uh in, you know at the part level and, and during assembly but there's a lot of challenges involved with that what are some of the challenges to, to actually make that happen in a meaningful way well the, the the major challenge is the fact that i've got to have much more sophisticated machines than i currently than i typically use you know it's not your average machine shop for example it's somebody uh, that's got a controlled environment and very sophisticated, by the way, new equipment, which implies, uh, you know, additional costs. Obviously, it takes more machine time. Uh, I, I think, though, that 
that again, all the all the uh, every other almost every other product that's built on a commercial scale these days already has holes in it. You know, whether you're building cars, appliances, computers, you know, cell phones, whatever. I mean, they've been doing that forever. We we are just now because of our size, we are just now getting into the opportunity to do that. I mean, I'll acknowledge the fact that uh, that our Boeing brothers have been working on this for 30, 30, probably 30, 35 years. And everybody has. I mean, this is something that that we worked on in the past. Um, and but it's now because of the equipment, because of the technology, become something that's that's reasonable. Uh, there's a lot of issues. There's a, a lot of I won't go into all the details, but there's a lot of issues for how you inspect parts, for how you for who can make them, how do you get your supply chain set up. Uh, but again, we see it as an, a huge opportunity to um, reduce the span time. And again, I, I thought I mentioned span time because it's one of my favorite subjects. You know, if you're building cars, you really care about span time because you are carrying all that whip uh, until you sell the car. That's not necessarily true in the defense business. However, somebody's paying for that whip. And so we've got to look at how we take advantage of that. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of it. You know, uh, we have a long way to go uh, developing that technology, but uh, it's, it's coming along. It's coming along quick. So I, I was at a at a, at a, a conference a couple of weeks ago in uh, for the government contractor contracting pricing summit and uh, Major General Cameron Holt spoke and he is the you have to look at his title he's the Assistant Deputy Secretary of the Air Force for contracting and one of the things that that he is really passionate about is is the the absolute necessity to shorten the acquisition cycle i mean you know as well as i do that you know f35 you know we we kicked that off back in 1995 you know the original competition and it took what 20 plus years to get the ioc i mean it was and the f22 was a very again a very long time and and Acquisition cycles been getting longer and longer and longer, and 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 General Holt's claim is, and, and I think he's right, is that you know the, the Chinese and the Russian uh, threat doesn't allow us to have twenty year acquisition cycles. We've got to do something that, uh, that we can get products to the warfighter much faster. How do you think digital engineering and digital transformation plays into that? What what is what does it offer in terms of shortening acquisition cycles? Well, you know, honestly, it is it is the key to acquisition cycle reduction because if I can't if I can't reduce my development time and if I can't reduce my test time, I won't I won't I really won't be able to touch that twenty year time frame. So the, the key to reducing uh, a twenty year time frame for developed prototype to IOC is really the use of digital engineering and not not necessarily just doing digital models, but the modeling and simulation, the uh, you know, the be able, the be able, the ability to use physics-based models to replace iron bird testing for like fuel systems and and those types of things, and and to be able to use lab to, to be able to use simulations to replace a lot of the laboratory testing that we do, both structural and software development. Uh, those are all pieces and part of that whole development cycle and. It's really the only route to the to the future is through modeling and simulation. So I'm a huge proponent of that. And and again, that's something that's going to take a while. Uh, but I've seen some pretty impressive uh, technology out there if we all work together. Uh, especially again, government. In, it's where this is one of the areas where academia can really play a big role for us. Uh, you know, I've been a big proponent of uh, how would I call it. Uh, uh, having universities get more, do more applied research instead of basic research. And this is a perfect example. Uh, you know, I want universities, it, like they do, frankly, in Europe, to spend more time worried about what I care about instead of, you know, what National Science Foundation cares about. So this, again, I see that as an opportunity. All right, uh, we're getting close on time here. So if anybody's got any questions in the audience, let's let's uh, fire them out real quick, and uh, so we can. Uh, um, we've only got a few more minutes left. Um, so Don, I wanted to ask you too about 
engineering design tools. So, of course, when you came in to the business in the 80s, we were just barely making the move from paper drawings to, to CAD scopes and that sort of thing. Um, you know, now virtually everybody in the industry uses CATIA or some variation of CATIA. What do you think the future is from a digital, what's the next generation of design tools look like? Well, I, th I think, I think they're, for example, I think we'll see a lot more generative design tools. What I mean by that is design tools where I've integrated analysis routines with them. You know, I'm getting FEM finite element model loads with them. For example, uh, I'm, I'm actually automatically checking clearances and fit. Uh, I am I'm doing producibility uh, analysis. I'm using automated uh, tools for machining that predicts the cost of machining, looking for the hard things. So I think we're going to see a lot more automation in the design tools. You see that a lot today, even with additive manufacturing, the things that are generative. Generative design means automatically designed. Now, don't get me wrong. We're a long way from pushing a button and having a design. Uh, that's, that's not in my lifetime, clearly, or most people on the call. But the fact is, is that we're going to get better at integrating all of our engineering tools because today it's a very, very serialized operation. You go from the design engineer to the stress guy to the flutter guy to the whatever, and, and those kind of things are going to get much more integrated and better. I think that's probably the key is, is the integrated test and the way that those tools will fit together to be able to get to these uh, digital twins for test reduction. And by the way, I, I keep talking about structure, but I believe software is in the same mode uh, that we are. Software, uh, people who don't realize it, realize that our world is a software world. You know, we, we hire a lot more software and computer electrical engineers these days than we do structure. Software is, is what drives the, the technology on something like F35. So we have a, a, a huge software laboratories. And again, more and more, you know, we're looking to things like open source architecture for software to be able to incorporate software a lot quicker from different, you know, different uh, people and different, uh, and there's a lot of issues there with, with flight safety and that kind of thing. But the fact is open, open system architecture is the future. And we're going to get a lot more engagement from all kinds of industries as they try to put an upgrade aircraft using that particular technology. So that's just one example. Uh, you know, software factory is, is obviously the other opportunity, agile development. So there's a lot of things going on in the software world uh, to not only to automate testing, but to develop software faster and quicker. And you'll see automation in I guarantee in the software world too, in terms of, you know, being able to, you know, get routines that are automatically, uh, you know, in place. So a lot of, a lot of things will go on there too. Okay. All right. Um, let me, let me ask one more question. So on the design conversation, so every, every program that I've ever been involved with or heard of, there's always a problem in the development phase, the aircraft program with loads or weights or both, right? And and so do you think that this automation and the design or, or partial automation and design and then the ability to do analysis concurrently with the design will help identify and eliminate some of those problems and maybe speed up the- If, if they don't, then we're wasting our time. So that's exactly correct. You know, we need to be able, there's certain things we need to get right from the get-go, that's one of them. And yes, if we don't get that solved, then we, we, we really aren't going to be making progress. And I believe that's possible to do. I believe we can do better at initial loads. We can do better at the configurations. We can do better with these virtual digital twins to be able to lower the risk for that kind of problem occurring, you know, later in production or later in development. Okay. All right. Well, I think we're just about out of time here. Uh, Don, I want to thank you for, for spending an hour with us and, and answering questions and, and giving us a, an excellent run through of what, what digital in engineering means. Uh, this is a second of uh, the series that we've done. Uh, we'll probably have another series, uh, an, another virtual meeting like this for the region 
um, probably in the next three months or so. So uh, anybody who's got ideas for topics, uh, you know, fire them to me. If there's something especially that you want to hear about, uh, let me know. And uh, I want to thank you all very much. Thank you. Later. Bye-bye.